Welcome to the talk. This is my first day back in the UK because I was on holiday and I wasn't expecting this many people to be in the room. <laughs> and also, um, but yeah, so my talk, um, and for those of you that don't know me, my name is Jamie Smith. Um, I've been at Sumo for about four years now. And currently I'm a principal game designer at Sumo Sheffield. And yeah, this is my talk. Um, a bit of a mouthful, but design sensibilities for a collaborative culture. And I'll go through that in kind of more detail as I go through. Um, so a little bit of background on me, because this actually feeds into the talk itself. Um, I've been in games for about 12 years now. As I said about a third of that time is roughly been at Sumo. Um, nine titles in terms of you know ones that have been released. You know probably more than that with you know ones that maybe didn't see the light of day and minor contributions. Um, but most recently, you know, released Call of Duty Vanguards. That was whilst I was at Sumo Newcastle. Um, so I was at Sumo Newcastle prior to uh, being at Sheffield. And also Hood Outlaws and Legends, and then before that, in the past, I've been at Ubisoft and a few other studios. Um, but the main thing with this is that um, I've worked on a lot of different games, and I've been in a lot of different studios and a lot of different teams, and everything that's on the right-hand side is a whole bunch of bullet points for things that I've kind of experienced, which have been, you know, big new games, established franchises like Call of Duty, you know, various games, genres, platforms, you know, the new stuff that's on the DualSense, PS5, um, large teams and small teams, broad scope and niche prototypes, um, you know, projects where we've had, you know, kind of modest budgets, projects with almost infinite budgets. Um, I've worked with people kind of regional and international, across language barriers, different time zones, and also as well development, I've been involved in publishing and academia. Now that's suffice to say is that there's a whole bunch of stuff that I'm hopefully uh, just want to give in this talk that I hope is useful. Um, and that's the context, and the context is really that change is the only constant. Um, every single team I've been on, you have to kind of adapt to you know, the makeup of the team, the history of the studio, the projects, you know, the, the time constraints, the money and so on. Um, so I come up with this question, and this is the question that I'm hoping to kind of answer, or at least provide some suggestions for today, which is, um, what universal approaches can be taken to foster a collaborative culture, specifically between mixed discipline peers, um, irrespective of team size, location and project scope? And when I talk about location, I'm also, you know, referring to, you know, hybrid work in, in, in that sense as well. Um, everything in this talk assumes that it's face-to-face -face or video calls, uh, just in general. Um, yeah, and you know, taking advantage of the hybrid kind of model. Um, so, a quick overview, um, and you know, this is kind of the, you know the feed line for the talk is that good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. So, you know, a lot of people have made mistakes, you know, I've made mistakes, and so on. Uh, but this is just a talk about different things that is, you know, generally speaking, um, pragmatic common sense. In 45 minutes time, you shouldn't really be surprised as to like anything that's in here really. But at the same time, I don't necessarily see people practice this stuff as much as you know they might preach it. Um, when I said at the start, there's a lot of people in the room, the other thing I was just gonna ask is, how many people in this room are not designers? Just with a quick show of hands. All right, that's roughly more than 50%, that's 60% or so. And the reason I mention that is, this is from a design perspective, but it's not necessarily just for designers. And the talk is split up into three parts. Um, I've called it the leader, but that's basically just the person that you know might be the focal point of the team. The team itself, so I'm, when I talk about that, I mean the dis mixed discipline team working on a feature, some small part of a game, and the project as a whole. And what I mean by that is, is that multiple teams coming together as a, as a whole. Um, most of the stuff I'm gonna mention is predominantly anecdotes and kind of analogies, things that I've experienced, but also things that I can uh, kind of relate to. Um, and when I say about timely, there's another part of this, which is some of the feedback or some suggestions I'm going to give, they're more applicable at different stages of the project than others. And uh, hopefully there'll be a diagram that kind of demonstrates that. All right, so this is the real kind of the meat of the talk. So for the leader, when I talk about the leader, I mean this in the broadest possible sense. So this is generally speaking where I would consider the lynch point, uh, the linchpin or the focal point of the team. Um, this is the person that's generally could be considered designer, but not always. Um, and in teams I've been in, it's always been the feature owner. So if you work on a feature, you've had feature owner or product owner experience, this is that kind of person. Um, they're the person that's pushing towards like wherever you're creating. So the first kind of suggestion, um, and this one you know, is more obvious than anything else, is that it's just about setting the course, um, intent and goals. You know, there's a whole bunch of projects I've been on. If you don't start with goals or you don't start with that like, clear intent of what you want to achieve, your team is kind of dead in the water, you know, just in terms of collaboration, you always need something to kind of be working towards, uh, first and foremost. Um, I remember, you know, when we first started working on Hood, we were working on the bow and arrow kind of mechanics, and the one thing with that was, you know, you've got these established kind of competitors that are out there, 
we were setting the goal of basically not necessarily to beat them in terms of making the ball feel more satisfying and you know make it feel even better. That's a team that you know has many years' experience doing that kind of thing. But we wanted to kind of level up, you know, what they're taking and, and push that in certain directions or push that kind of further. And I'll cover that kind of later on. But the more, the more broad thing with this is really it's just that if you don't, if you have a team that doesn't have clearly defined goals, you're basically just rudderless um, in the offset. And the other side of that is in teams with prescriptive goals, which I've had this before as well, is that the team lacks an autonomy. So in both cases, you know, you're kind of putting yourself on a, on a, on a bad foot. Um, but the reason I mention this is because as soon as you start to set yourself intent and goals, and this is normally at the, two, the front two thirds of the project, the little diagram that's just on there, if you think of one is basically being the start of the project, three is being the end, you know, as you come to ship in, and two is kind of the messy middle, and that's what that diagram kind of represents. So intent and goals, and the next one is all about the magic number. Um, so the magic number is always three. Um, every single project I've ever worked on, it's, it's always three. Um, it, it, in fact, it just takes you, it's, like, it's more about how long it takes you to work out that three is the magic number. Um, and what I mean by that is, when it comes to, say, features, what are the top three things that you're going to do with the feature? What are the top three most important things that you're going to do in the project? What are the three things that you're going to focus on? The reason why it's three, uh, you might have heard of about cog cognitive load, um, and basically the idea is that the human brain can only store three to seven pieces of information at any given time, aside from a phone number, their own phone number, and three is at the lower end of that. So anytime you're going to talk to people, don't give them massive reams of lists of things to do, or you know, communicate with people. Keep it succinct, keep it to three things uh, always. And again, that's, that's for all you know, aspects of, of development. So if I come back to our uh, kind of idea of hood, I mentioned this earlier, there's no shame in standing on the shoulders of anything that's kind of out there. Um, we have this concept, and by the way, um, you know, a lot of the things I'm mentioning here are not necessarily things that I've came up with. These are things that you know, I've kind of stolen from other people. Um, we have this concept that we've always mentioned for a lot of years is marginal innovation. This to me is the reason why I'm game in games, which is you take something that's existing and you make it the, the special from the ordinary. So in our case, you know, marginal innovation, we've got a bow and arrow game. Um, I don't know how many of you have played Hood, but basically the few things that we introduced for this was we knew there was going to be gameplay opportunities where we'd be able to provide a tangible benefit to the player. And we had a PvP game as, as opposed to, you know, Tomb Raider, where it's just player versus environment. Um, we were using the dual sense haptics. So anybody that was just in the previous talk, um, we did that, you know, shortly after Sackboy it kind of came out. Um, and that was all about you know making the strain of the bow transfer through your arms and that kind of feeling. Um, other games hadn't used the bow and arrow with the haptics by that point. There was only um, uh, the Astro Bots that was on release and they did something quite different to what we did. We did the tension of the bow that was on the triggers. We did the 3D audio, so you know the arrows are whispering past your ears. You can kind of feel that from all directions. And also we had something else where basically if you were shooting something in the distance, we would be much more generous with shooting that target than if you were up close, for example, so you can get the really satisfying kind of long shot kills. Um, for anybody that's played the game, you might have come across some of those scenarios where you get headshots from miles away, and we've had you know kind of videos or compilation videos that have been online on YouTube that kind of satisfy what we originally wanted to intend, to, so you know, people get the satisfaction of those kind of headshots. Um, but in general, always try to stick to something that basically is meaningful and feasible for the team as opposed to just completely reinventing the wheel, because uh, it's not necessarily impossible, it's just much more difficult. Um, the next one, form follows function. Um, so a lot of these examples are taken from examples that I had experienced, and this is one of them that we had on uh, Call of Duty. Um, so on the latest Call of Duty, so this is Vanguard, the, the image that you see on the screen there, one of the things they wanted to do was kind of amplify the grenade mechanics in the game. This was a feature that already existed, you know, it's in every single Call of Duty game. It's been there since, you know, the dawn of time. But a couple of the things they want to introduce was they want to make this only applicable to lethal grenades. So this is a bunch of functions that they wanted to introduce. They want a minimalist aesthetic, um, something that suggests the throw trajectory. And the reason they mention that is the character that you're playing in this mission is like the explosives specialist. So they want to show to the player, you know, how you can get the best use of this character. So it signifies the impact and ending locations, you know, the timing of danger as well. So normally when you hold a grenade in Call of Duty, you have to wait until it explodes, until you know that you're definitely dead. In this case, we want to signify that to the player ahead of time. Um, and basically, this is a first-time tutorial. So that's one of the reasons why you see the prompt on the screen as well, the first time this happens. And the idea is you've got to throw the grenade into that hatch that's in the distance. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to see, but you throw it into a tank, pretty much. And on top of that, it's also applicable for a multiplayer perk as well. 
So that's a whole bunch of functions, and the, you know the kind of the form of that is in in the most simplest way possible is that this is basically just a UI that's shown on screen that just says this is where the grenade's going to go, this is how it's going to work. You can also use that multiplayer, so you can use it to bounce off a wall and around a corner and things like that. Um, but the main thing with that is that it's just it's a whole bunch of functions that we use to determine what the form is going to be. And the form in this case was, it's just something for the UI designers to do for the most part. You know, they already had the animations, they already had the grenade models, they already had the hands. But it's more about instead of just creating a whole bunch of work, it's what's the function going to be and how's that going to feed into the form. So, you know, you didn't need necessarily haptics, or you didn't necessarily need anim animations if you didn't need them. Um, but just to keep that in mind, function first and then how that impacts the form, because uh, effectively you're creating work for people. And I'll come back to that later on. Um, so when I said earlier, uh, the, the thing about marginal innovation, you know, that I'm a big fan of. The other thing I'm also a big fan of is the, you know, what I call maybe like the silver bullet. Um, the thing where you've got several design problems and you're trying to kill them all at once with one like, special idea. Um, I've only had that probably a couple of times in my career and I think this was one of them, which is basically um, we've got Hood, he's in this top right hand corner, that's Robin Hood from, from Hood Outlaws and Legends. Um, he's got an explosive arrow. That wasn't originally an explosive arrow. Um, previously, you just had to dash. You basically you could dash from A to B, and that's, that's pretty much all you could do. Um, but we had a number of problems in the game that we wanted to solve. And even though it's not the most original idea, an explosive arrow, it, it's been done in Tomb Raider and a few other games, um, it solved a whole bunch of problems. And those problems were is that we had an ability that didn't even use Robin's weapon. Uh, so the cover star of the game has got a bone arrow, and he didn't even use the bone arrow for his special ability. Um, it empowers the cover star, so in that case, we have the sheriff in the game, so for those of you that have or haven't played it, we've got the sheriff, he's a big kind of burly guy, walks around the map, he's pretty scary. Um, this is one of the only things that he could take him down with. We have John, who's kind of our big heavy character, he runs around the map, basically he's very difficult to kill, he's almost like a berserker kind of character. This is another thing that kind of negates him. And the other thing is that this arrow, before this point, one arrow could kill one person. And until this point, this was a way that would basically kill multiple people. And that was especially true in this scenario, where the whole idea of the game is you're trying to escape at the docks at the end of the level. A lot of people would just crowd, out, crowd around each other and just meet shield and just you know, stand in front of the chest carrier whilst you're trying to winch away. And this was a way to kind of mitigate that. All that, this is suffice to say, is that for one idea, which was an explosive arrow, which is a bit of VFX, you know, an explosive kind of sphere, an arrow that you trigger and it's your special ability, negated all of those issues kind of instantly. Um, the other thing I just come back to there is, is generally speaking, you shouldn't try to look to make work for people. Ideally, you should try to, you know, if you can, solve as many problems as you can at once. Uh, but as I said, that's, that's pretty difficult, uh, but, it's, but it's possible. Um, another thing I keep in mind, and I try to do this on a daily basis, but um, it's just a general piece of advice more for designers than anything else, is just this idea of minimum change, maximum impact. So, whenever I come to tune stuff, any kind of tuning, whatever the number may be, designers typically have a thing where you might change a number and then you test it and you see what that number's kind of changed or how it's affecting the game. The thing I always look for is what's the one number that makes the biggest difference to the game in terms of the player experience, in terms of satisfaction. However, I'm also looking for the one number that creates the least amount of work for anybody else whatsoever, to, just to keep that in kind of mind as well. So the reason I put this example on the, on the screen here is, um, this is from Call of Duty Vanguard again. The main difference with Call of Duty Vanguard, or one of the things that they want to do, was they want to make it so that basically you could take the guns in the game and make every single bullet feel much more special than it previously was. The way you do that is you reduce the amount of ammo that's in the game entirely. Um, and that has absolutely no effect on anybody kind of whatsoever. Um, they already have reload systems, they already have animations for it. They've got a whole bunch of stuff that they've had for years, you know, from previous games. But the main thing with this is if you want to make a game where you want to care about the bullets or you want to make the player think a lot more about the shots, what's the smallest possible change that you can do that has the biggest possible impact? Just reduce the ammo. And in this case, creates no work for anybody else whatsoever, but creates a vastly different gameplay experience. Um, and then the last one, and this is another thing, uh, you know, for the last one for this section, and this is another one that, you know, I find it, it tends to be how long does it take for a designer or anybody to work this out before you, you kind of level up a little bit more, a bit more but it's always about we before me. Um, so it's not like Hitman, where you're kind of going into the environment, you're a lone wolf. It's all about you working together as a team, and it's about taking on everybody's kind of ideas. That might be, you know, fairly simple, fairly straightforward, kind of obvious advice. I'll cover that some more, but... 
the way I always think of this is a conductor can't do anything without the orchestra. So it doesn't really matter how good a design you are, if you can't get everybody playing the same band in the same kind of tune, um, you're always going to struggle uh, with that stuff. I should say towards the end of the talk, I've got a bunch of references and things like suggested kind of read-ins from that um, that go further. So quick summary for this section. Um, quick summary, ideally, this is, you know, this is you're on a new team, you're working on a new feature, what you want to do to get things kind of kicked off. Ideally, three clear goals and innovate. I put this a little bit in for, for me personally, but underappreciated features or overlooked features. Um, I'm a big fan of finding things that hasn't changed for the past 15 years and then basically look to kind of elevate that kind of further. Um, the next one is focus on minimalism. Um, when I say minimalism, don't change things just for the sake of changing things. Don't add things to the game that creates work for people that don't necessarily need to be there. And that's the thing about keeping an eye on the creative ingredients as well. You know, be, be mindful of what you add into the game as well as what you're changing. And the other one is just being a great teammate is always more important than being a great designer. Um, not just designer, but any discipline, kind of whatsoever. Um, you know, the team that I'm part of now, some of them are in the back, they haven't heckled yet, is, uh, you know, more than anything else, it's, it's a good team, as opposed to, like, there isn't, you know, the, the Eric Cantona, there isn't the Ronaldo, everybody's, you know, everybody's great, nobody's the superstar. Um, so that's about the, the leader. So this is about the team. Um, when I'm chatting about the team, again, I said earlier, this is about, normally, a mixed discipline team trying to create something of value for the game. So this might be a feature, for example. Generally speaking, this will be bringing either the leader or you know, the focal point's vision to life, or it might be you know, the directors mention something, you're the team that's going to you know, bring the director's goals to life. Um, so the first thing is, is that it's to embrace the unfamiliar. When I said earlier, I've been on a lot of different projects. One of the reasons I mentioned that was because before I worked on an open world game, I'd never worked on an open world game. Before I worked on a first-person shooter, I'd never worked on a first-person shooter. Before I worked on a platformer, I'd never worked on a platformer, and so on. Um, if you stick to one studio, you know, the, you know, one role, one project, one one thing, you can get stuck into an alleyway where you kind of you don't necessarily want to, you know, spread your rings and brand, kind of branch out anymore. Also, you know, as, as was the case, you know, kind of recently, if people are moving on to a new project, it's basically just take that on board and just be positive and pragmatic. It's just there's always going to be challenges. You're going to have to figure new ways out. Um, it's just to start with a positive kind of open mindset as opposed to this isn't the same thing as what I've done kind of previously. Because, um, again, much like I said with goals earlier, you start with people with more of a, a closed kind of mindset. Um, this is one I actually quite like. Um, I quite like... Kind of, you know, when I talk about practice, what you preach. This is something I quite like to do personally. Um, meeting etiquette, listen first, talk last. Um, this is especially probably, as you, I would say, as you go further up the chain in terms of experience, or you, you know, you're kind of mindful, uh, mindful of what you can bring to the table. If you've got somebody in the room, for example, that has worked on open world games for the past ten years, and you're working on an open world game. The chances are is that everybody in the room is going to just focus on that person, what they're going to say, because they're the oracle of knowledge. At the same time, they're going to do what that pe person says because they are the oracle of knowledge. And that person might dominate the conversation, and then that person becomes, you know, effectively the focal point of the conversation, as opposed to feeding in everybody's ideas. So one thing I would just suggest is, this is especially, again, for more senior people, is let the less experienced people or the quietest voices in the room kind of go first, if possible. You know, you might need to egg them on or kind of bring them into the conversation. And then more from a leadership or a senior kind of perspective is use that to kind of close all of everybody's thoughts together into like what we're going to do next. Um, so it's one just to be mindful of, but I've seen a lot of meetings, so, some people, you know, a bit like me here, is the, like the sound of their own voice kind of thing. And it's just one of those, it's just to be careful of, you know, don't speak up too much, especially if it's going to be at the detriment of other people that are in the call or, or the meeting. Um, the next one is yes and. Um, a lot of people have heard this, you know, maybe different ways. When I mentioned this to somebody, uh, they said a, an even better version of this, which was um, write drunk, edit sober, uh, which, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is just the idea of don't ever shoot down ideas. You know, try and like plus onto them or kind, kind of add, hello. Uh, or try add onto them. And um, the reason for that is it goes back to what I said earlier. You're trying to commit, create a collaborative culture. Somebody brings an idea to the room and you say, that's not going to work because. We tried that before and it didn't work. We did that last week and it didn't happen. We had frame rate issues when we introduced that and stuff. That person's not going to bring ideas to the table kind of anymore. Um, and yes and is basically just, you know, always try and add to the idea. And then what I would also suggest is I would have probably two rounds. This could be if you were trying to, you know, fix a certain problem or as a feature. 
I would have the first round of anything goes. Everybody in the room, bring your ideas to the table, how we're going to solve this thing. And then I would have the second round, you know, whether this be the next day after a cool enough period or something, and just go, okay, we're going to whittle list ideas down to the types of things that we're probably going to do in terms of feasibility, time, you know, whether we have animation on the team, whether we don't, you know, programming time and so on. Um, so just keep that in mind, you know, inflate rather than deflate. Uh, next up. Oh, yeah, so I, I did forget about these ones, but this is kind of a two-parter. Um, so I have this kind of saying that I've been using for a while, I will claim this one, uh, not, not some of the other stuff, is basically just the idea that it's uh, agree on the big things and disagree on the small things. I have been in meetings, unfortunately, like, you know, even, this, uh, you know, even pretty recently, where somebody might bring up an idea, or it might be some direction, or it might be a high level kind of concept, and as soon as that gets introduced, you know, coupled with the thing I've just mentioned, somebody says, that's not going to work, because... And that's somebody disagreeing on the ambition, which is the big kind of umbrella over everything. And instead, really, what you should be disagreeing on is the details. Um, you don't necessarily have to like kind of the journey of where you're going kind of up the mountain, as what was in that previous image. But you should be flexible on which direction you're going to take to get up that mountain, uh, just in general. But I've seen it all too often in a lot of meetings where somebody says an idea and it gets shot down straight away. And that was really the crux of like everything that you're going to do after that point. And also suggest that that same person is going to challenge every single idea that you say after that point. Um, the other way I, I mention this is I like the concept of kind of, you know, the, the boy crowd wolf. And it's just the idea that try not to say something too much or else people kind of, you know, zone out or they'll, they'll think that you're the kind of the problem child kind of thing. Um, just keep that in mind. So, yeah, agree on the big things, disagree on the small things. Um, this one's a little bit more long winded, so I will take a swig. Right. The 3090 feedback. So I'll give you the I'll give you the, the kind of story first. The image that's on screen um, that is from the release version of Hood. Uh, we were with melee combat, so we have a bunch of guards and we have you know Tuck Fry Tuck our character. He's swinging around, beating them all in the face. Except that was the final released version of the game. That was the final released version of the combat. Um, the first version of the combat that we ever had in the game was the most rudimentary thing that you know anybody could think of. You know temporary assets kind of dodgy animations, things weren't necessarily working properly, um, everything was pretty hokey, the ground was kind of all over the place, so sometimes you were hacking at people's ankles and so on. Um, and the problem with that was, is that everybody that played it judged it as if it was God of War, which had just came out about two weeks before. And the main thing about that is that in any project that you're working on, just be mindful that the chances are is that you're going to compare something that's in progress, and this was really rudimentary, I'm talking like you know a couple of weeks worth of work, to something that a team of 300 people has done over the past four years. This is where the 3090 feedback kind of comes in. One thing I would suggest for this is, is that in general, consider things a first pass or a final push. Um, it's either rudimentary or it's almost ready for the shelf, just in general, uh, kind of broad strokes. Your feedback that you give on a particular feature should reflect one of those two things. Um, from an artistic point of view, for example, one of the things I like to think of this is, the 90% is you want to scrutinize every single pixel that's on the screen to the nth degree. But you're not going to do that uh, when it's at the start of the game and you've got a block out and you've got these half dodgy kind of animations and things uh, kind of going on. So just to keep in mind that, you know, 3090 just reflects, is it kind of like first pass and is it the final? Um, another way I put this, I remember on Call of Duty, they called the 30% the meat and potatoes and they called the 90% the gravy. And people would always say, oh, that's just gravy, and that's something that we're going to add on to the top. But nobody wants a bowl of gravy. You need the kind of foundational kind of stuff there first. Um, yeah, so just keep that in mind. And also, that's for the person who's you know, presenting that to people as well, to tell people, by the way, this is the type of feedback that I'm looking for. You know, I don't need to know that the textures are missing on the character, because clearly that looks like a brown Power Ranger, or whatever it may be. Um, you know, it's clearly placeholder. Um, so the next one is just about collective cohesion. Um, so this is the next thing I'm, I'm kind of quite interested in as well. Um, it's been mentioned, you know, even just in the talk that we were just in about haptics. It's just that everything that you do in a game, regardless, you know, it doesn't matter what feature, how small or how large it is, um, it's all about, you know, collective cohesion, you know, much, much like that image there. Um, everybody is working together to do something that they can do more than that's, that's on their own. Just want to keep in mind that, you know, especially from a design perspective, Design alone isn't going to bring this thing to life. Um, it's going to be multiple disciplines. You know, if I just go through, through some of the stuff, I've just got a list here of the things that we did on Hood that was not design, 
We did projectile behaviors, we did haptics, we did hit reactions, which is animation, we did dynamic hitboxes, we had all the server replication stuff, you know, all the programming. We had kill confirms, stingers, you know, for headshots, things that felt really satisfying. We had a blood impact and surface materials, so that was more VFX, and then we had UI notifications that were telling you, you know, where you hit somebody, if you killed somebody, if you got points, and so on. All of that is basically the way I look at any feature in the game is everything is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, you could have a couple of those things and it would feel okay. You could have none of those things, it would feel terrible. But if you have all of those things, they'll feel great. Um, so just keep in mind that every single thing that you do throughout development is always greater than just you know your single discipline, regardless of what discipline there is. Um, so quick summary of this section is firstly, um, be pragmatic, you know, embrace challenge and ambition. Um, again, rather than you know, kind of trying to shoot it down or you know, to put, put a, a spanner in the works. Um, next one is be a good listener and elevate the ideas of others. Um, the listener one is probably the key takeaway. There is you know, let people kind of talk first or let people kind of listen first. Um, and then the other one is just to crowdsource contributions, but temper the feedback as well. So just when I said about that 3090 one earlier, um, the other danger with that 3090 one, by the way is that um, somebody can give you feedback about something and the feedback isn't very useful. So that's the first problem. And the second problem is you've got the nicest possible way to tell them that their feedback wasn't very useful. So just to keep that in mind, like the 39 thing is, is pretty useful. Hopefully. Uh, all right, so the last section for the project. So everything up until now has been, you know, the focal point, the team, the team itself. This is about like multiple teams working together, you know, multiple features, AI, you know, gameplay mechanics, combat, wherever it may be. Um, so, first one, strong pillars, no filler. Um, the best games that I've worked on, and I, by the way, I'm super proud of Hood and like what the, what the Newcastle team achieved, it was really good, um, was just that this is the game, this is the game that we're making, maybe it's not necessarily for everybody, but this is what we're doing, and we're not going to change that. Um, I've been on so many projects where as soon as they go into a feedback or they have some kind of play test or they have some people in the room that aren't necessarily too happy about the, the experience, they'll kind of water down the experience to the point of where basically it just becomes kind of nothing. Um, you see the opposite now with, with kind of Elden Ring where it's a really unpopular game in, in terms of um, you know, the types of things that it does, but actually it's gained a massive following because of exactly those kind of things. You know, it's, it's kind of honing in specific uh, experience. But one of the reasons why I mentioned this about no filler as I remember at one point in development, uh, a few people remember the story if you were working on Hood, is uh, we, we had like an arena where you could get together with your friends and that would be the preparation before the match. And somebody suggested at some point is let's put something related to like Monty Python and the Holy, Holy Grail there. Any time that you do anything medieval, it's always going to bring up that kind of reference anyway. But the point was that that idea kind of stayed around a bit too long in development, this kind of jokey uh, kind of thing that didn't really fit the experience. And at some point, it's easy to kind of name drop that reference, but some people will get latched onto that kind of idea. And then it stays in the game too long. And then by the time it comes to cutting, you've got a whole bunch of people that love that idea. And really, it should have never existed in the first place because it's supposed to be a dark and gritty uh, kind of experience. But yeah, just to keep that in mind. Uh, the next one is about embracing the inspiration. So again, just to embracing things rather than pushing things away. Um, I did briefly mention the sheriff earlier. That's the sheriff that's on screen. Um, if you've played Resident Evil, it's very much the same as like a Mr. X. Um, you know, the whole concept of the character is just the relentless for sure. Um, as I said earlier, there's nothing wrong with, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants or taking, you know, tidbits. You know, some people call it like magpie design, you know, take things from other games. Um, so again, I've got the list here. Sorry, I'm reading my notes, but there's, there's a whole bunch of these. But yeah, so it basically stands head and above every single the character in the game. So all of our characters in the game are 1.8 meters tall, and the sheriff is clearly taller. You know, he's like 2.5 meters or something. Um, we intended to have a slow walk, like Darth Vader. So again, you know, spoilers, Obi-Wan Kenobi, if you've seen that, basically Darth Vader always walks, he never runs. It makes him much, much scarier. Um, the booming footsteps, like Jurassic Park's water ripple. So again, we just chatted about haptics in the previous one. We had, when the sheriff is walking nearby to you, you can feel his footsteps getting heavier. And also that's directional in the 360 as well. So you kind of know roughly where he is. The reason you want to know where he is is because he's carrying a key, and the key allows you to carry into the safe. Um, so that's that. Um, he has a terrifying voice, like the mountain in Game of Thrones. A similar thing with this, at one point in development, we got asked the question, um, what's the weapon that the sheriff should carry? You know, should he have giant double swords? Should he have you know, big meat cleavers or something? And then it was the next day that we just suggested, why does he even need a weapon? It's much more terrifying if you just pop someone's head. And that's the same as what they did you know, in Game of Thrones. So you know, basically taking these examples, and the other one is that he's a one-shot enemy as well. So if you play The Last of Us, you've got the clicker. Um, if you go near the clicker, just one-shot you. We had the same thing. 
that's like half a dozen examples that we took from other games and just fed it into this one character and he started getting that in the feedback. The feedback starts saying, oh, he's like that guy from Resident Evil or he's really scary like that monster from, you know, Game X. And that was intentional, but he's got a totally different experience because it's in a med medieval kind of state. Um, the next one, I'm pretty passionate about this as well, um, is value first. The little diagrams I've been putting on each of the screens are kind of, again, you know, first third, middle third, kind of end third. I'd probably say for this one that this is more about the start and kind of the middle of the project, uh, which is about value first. And what I mean by that is you should always, much like kind of Agent 47, do the one thing that should always stay in your sights at any given time. Um, for some people, they work on a feature where they want to work on like five different things at once because they think they're getting more bang for buck than if you just did one thing at once. Definitely at the end of the project, that's definitely the case. You know, you get the, like, the bang for buck thing. My take on that is always you should always do the one thing that's the most important thing to do at any given stage. Doesn't matter if it takes six hours or six weeks, you always do the thing that's the most important uh, for the game itself. Um, so just to keep that in mind, because it means that everybody in the team can rally around that one thing as well, instead of getting kind of dis distributed off into multiple things. Um, next one, interrogate the feedback, uh, define the problem. So this is an interesting example, because a lot of the people that worked on Hood probably forgot about this, especially in the early days. Um, so we have this character, that's John on that, that picture there, uh, basically our big burly kind of strong guy, he can hold up gates, he can smash people in the face. At the start of the game, uh, really early on the project, he used to have a giant spear on his back, as in you know a big javelin you could throw at people. It was pretty cool, you could throw it, you could impale people on the world, you can one-shot people, you have this big guy that feel you know, really empowering like a strong man. Um, and one day, we decided to take that out of the game. And at the time, that was one of the funnest things that was probably in the game. And you can imagine the hate mail that started to come into my kind of outlook. Um, and the main thing with that was, is that it was a unanim unanimously unpopular decision um, to take it out of the game. The reason we took it out of the game is because there's problems with the control scheme. And the second one is that we wanted to kind of separate the characters. So we have Robin and Marion, who are more like our ranged characters. We have John and Tuck, who are more like our me melee characters. So we don't have this kind of cross between them. Originally, we had a cross kind of between them. So a unanimously popular, unpopular decision. About two weeks later, we removed that from the game, and we introduced the ability for John to basically go invincible. So you can't kill him, kind of whatsoever. So he goes into a rage mode, runs around, kills everybody. Not a single person to this day has ever come back to me and said, put the spear back in the game since. And the reason, or the, kind of, the point I'm kind of getting at there is, the problem was never that John had a spear and we took it out of the game. The problem was is that the spear felt empowering and we took the power fantasy out of the game. As soon as we put this new ability in season rage mode, you were empowered again. And that was more in line with the experience and also tied into the types of things that we want to do with the character. So the main thing there is just define the problem through interrogating the feedback. You know, don't do what people say in raw. People, what people say and what they mean is two different things. Um, so just keep that in mind. And it'll stop you, stop you and the team chasing down rabbit holes. Um, and this is another one. We call this like normally like subtractive design, but um, especially this is really good for the for, for the final third. But basically, this is good for you know any discipline, a subtractive kind of method. Um, I'll probably say maybe at the start of people's careers and maybe certain projects that people just want to add stuff to the game. They just want to keep adding all the time. The problem with adding things to the game, I said earlier about being the focal point of the team is your goal is to not add content to the game because adding content means adding work, which means adding time, which means adding cost and so on. And especially in the final third, that's a big, big problem. The mission that's on screen is from Call of Duty again. Uh, this mission is called Bougainville. Um, so it's all about a jungle kind of survival mission. And again, I'm just going to read through these notes because there's a huge list of stuff that they did. So we had the ammo scarcity that we'd already introduced in the game. So that was a feature that existed. We had an emphasis on crouch and stealth. So this is about a mission where you're dumped in the middle of a jungle and you're supposed to survive. Um, so that's that. We had the ability to manually trigger waypoints, which is what was already in the game as well. And the waypoints were basically where you're going to go on the level uh, to, to lead you to a teammate, basically. There was lots of pre-existing trees and foliage, so everything that you see on that screen is probably from World at War or you know some of the older Call of Duty games. They already had a bunch of that stuff. The lighting and volumetric fog, so you, how far you can see, they already know like what's going to affect the frame rate and what isn't, so they've already you know dealt with this stuff. And the other one is that they had persistent low health, so they basically capped your health regeneration. Every single thing that I've mentioned there was already in the game. 
And this mission was just tuned in such a way that basically they took things that they already existed and built the Lego bricks into a different kind of way. Um, and that's a way to not add... To, to add value to the game, but to not add time and kind of cost to a project. Um, a few of us say that this is an underrated skill. I would go one further and say, like, this is the difference between a good designer and a great designer um, as, you, as you're kind of going through the ranks and stuff. It's a subtractive method. And also, when I say that, that's not necessarily just from a design perspective. You know, if you can use animations in multiple places and things as well, that's, that's pretty good um, if you don't have the coverage. Um, love the player. I think there's a couple more. I think there's this and one more after this. Um, so, love the player. This is one that I'm a big fan. In fact, we were just chatting about this in the car on the way this morning. Is that, um, you know, just the idea that basically too many games put features in the game, or they put ideas in the game, and the first complaint is it's too overpowered, or that thing's really good, but it's too strong. So we're going to take it out of the game. Um, one thing I think you've got to remember, and this is for everybody really, um, you know, all disciplines, we're in a world now where you can pay 60 quid and you can get 500 games on Game Pass. And the moment that you have a bad experience, somebody's going to just going to dump that and jump onto something else. Um, so just to keep that in mind. And the reason I mention that is, ideally, you should always be looking at to try and impact the player. But also, this is for every single discipline. I've had stuff in the past where, um, where basically other disciplines, not, well, not uh, design included, um, can impact the gameplay experience. And just one example, you know, the one that's on screen. We had stealth in Hood for quite a while, but the stealth wasn't necessarily done in such a way that it was empowering to the player. Or there was other play styles that were much more dominant that I see never ever used that. Um, and until we tuned, you know, say the AI kind of placements, until we tuned the, you know, the terrain, uh, we had lighting issues a lot through the development. So basically somebody changes the lighting straight away, you can know you no longer use the stealth kind of gameplay and so on. So just be mindful that you're always trying to love the player and empower them and try not to do things that's going to stand in their way. Um, there's a really old school example that still sticks in my mind of this. I worked on Driver like a lot of years ago, 10 years ago or something. The whole idea of driver is about going through alleyways and smashing through boxes like a bullet and things like that. Um, and then artists would just place a giant metal object that was like half the weight of the car in an alleyway and you would hit it and you would just instantly smash into it and you, you would stop dead. And that's the type of experience where somebody placing something so innocuous can actually create a terrible gameplay experience. And if that's the first 30 seconds of the game that you play, they're going to turn it off straight away. So just keep that in mind. But yeah, always love the player. And then I think this is the last one. It's just about give credit where it's due um, and celebrate successes. So a cool example about this one is um, the mission on screen. This is from Call of Duty, uh, Vanguard again. This is the Midway mission. So if anybody's seen the film Midway or knows about the story Midway, it's basically just about playing kind of battle in the, in the middle of the sea. I said just, it's, it's pretty important. Uh, but anyway, with that, um, and in this mission, basically the idea was is that um, at some point you're going to fly down, you're going to shoot some bombs into these boats, and you're going to fly away, you're going to have a dogfight, and then that's it, basically, like kind of job done. The problem with that was, for most of the development, it had kind of two problems. Um, the first problem is that it was one of the lowest rated missions in the game for a long time. The other problem was it was remembered as the lowest rated mission in the game because it's the only mission where you fly in a plane, every single other one you're on the ground. So at one point during development, they come back to us and they said, um, this was in the design team that we were working in. They basically said, do you have any ideas for what you would do to change this mission? And then this was before Top Gun. I mentioned this like a year ago, uh, Maverick in a rust bucket. That was my pitch for like for the mission. The idea is that you're an expert dogfighter. You're basically gonna get shot really easily. You're gonna feel like really on edge. And even if you're not necessarily gonna get shot down, you're gonna feel like the bullets of the, you know, the, the, the warships and things firing past you. To their credit, they changed the entire mission from a whole bunch of stuff that I'd kind of suggested and then put it forward. Bear in mind that this is some random guy, you know, I was working with the Call of Duty guys there on the, the west coast of uh, you know, America. Some random guy in the northeast suggests some stuff for like a Call of Duty mission. They finally put it in the game. Not only that, they also celebrate that success with not just myself, but other people that were in the team as well, kind of saying, by the way, this person's come up with a cool idea, let's do it. Um, on a side note, the people that I was working with with the team that worked on the original Dead Space. So all of them were all my idols as well. So on top of that, not only is that, it's these people that are saying good things about you. The reason I mention this one is, I don't find this happens enough um, just in games in general. Um, I've been on projects or I've been on teams before where the first interaction you have somebody is always either a negative or they want to complain about something in the game, but they didn't want to mention the six months of things that you did beforehand that were really good. Um, so just to keep that in mind. But yeah, always celebrate successes um, regardless in the, in the team. And the summary for that one, we're just coming up to the end. 
is first and foremost, uh, strong pillars and soft inspirations. That's my kind of perfect blend for, especially I, I should say that this is more tempered towards AAA kind of development. Um, but yeah, in, in general, I would say that. Interrogate feedback, put value first, sub subtract content. Um, I would always remove something before I would add something. If, if I add something, I like to think of it now as like it's a big deal. Like, like we have to add this because it needs to be, otherwise I would prefer to take things away. Um, love the player and celebrate successes. You could say that is love the player, love the team, whatever you may be, but yeah, it's, it's just keep that in mind. And then just some final takeaways before some questions come with this. So if you go back to the first thing I mentioned was fostering a collaborative culture between mixed discipline peers, irrespective of team size, location or project scope. Um, these are my suggestions. So there's your kind of first seven, there's your kind of second seven for the team, and that's your third seven. Um, just in case the, these slides should be made available afterwards in case anybody wants to uh, catch up on them. So that's 21 suggestions for me. And these are suggestions, by the way. Um, the one thing I guarantee is you'll have a much better time if you're doing th these things than if you're not doing these things. But I don't want to say, like, this is Mary Poppins, you know, everything's going to be perfect, because it won't be. <laughs> um, so that's that. And the only other one, you know, just before I take any questions, is um, in the interest of providing some more suggestions, three things on here that would kind of point out. Leaders eat last, uh, bottom center is really good. Creativity Inc, bottom right, even if you've not read that book, uh, most people have probably heard a bit about the Pixar kind of method, and then communicating across disciplines, top middle. Um, so if you're gonna look at those three first, they'll also lead you to a bunch of the other ones that are on that page as well, um, but they're really good. And I think that's it. Thanks for that. Um, before I take any questions, the other thing I just mentioned is just practice on what you preach. All of that tiny text that you just saw on the screen was everybody that helped in, in help making this presentation. Um, so yeah, shout out to the people that can't read the text in Fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, it's four o'clock, but if you want to have five minutes worth of questions, I'll still be around. Um, but yeah, go, go for it if anybody's got any questions. Stunned silence. <laughs> yeah, hello. Hello. I'll, I'll repeat the question as well. Can... <clears throat> That's my voice now. Um, you had a slide in there that was about sticking to the game pillars and that that was like one thing that you liked on Hood. And I found it kind of interesting because I thought in hindsight after Hood, should we have stuck to the pillars? And is that something that you still feel strongly about yeah. since Hood? So I suppose is the question more like how strongly should you stick to those pillars in general? Or how yes, much like is it them? still useful to actually stop and reevaluate? Are these pillars gonna help the game succeed? Yeah, I, I, in that sense, evaluating the pillars, I would just say you do that through the certain milestones. Really, I, I think at the start of the project, we're going to make a stealth game, and then maybe things are not working quite right. Is that because the stealth's not working quite right, or is it because people are enjoying the combat more? And then at that point, you would say, should we pivot towards more of a combat, or should we do a bit both? And in the end, if anyone's not played Hood, I think Hood is like a little bit both, but the optimal play style is to play stealth. But generally speaking, well, the people who played it most, like we have. <laughs> uh, but but I, I would just say at a certain point in development, you have to evaluate that and just stick with it. And on Call of Duty, you know, even that example I mentioned earlier, they want to be super strict about the ammo. They didn't change for the whole of like the nine months. They said, this is what's happening. Even if in the play test, people said, this is really annoying compared to previous Call of Duty games. They stuck with it. So yeah, I think basically you've got to evaluate at certain points, pre-production, production, wherever it may be, and then stick to your guns if you want. You know, that, that if the feedback's telling you something different, you don't have to stick to the, you don't have to go with the feedback. But yeah, that, that's a director's choice at that point. Thank you. Uh, yeah, at the back, I'll come over here. Cool guys, getting the steps in. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, so with regard to the project um, recommendations or suggestions in particular, do you ever find it challenging to reconcile the, the ideals with like commercial need? So yeah. things like value first, love the player. Well, we kind of need to make money too, right? So loot crates, uh, progression loops, and things like that knowing that in your heart maybe they don't necessarily contribute to the game creatively, but feeling that need to still fulfill the obligation. 
Yeah. So is that more about like your principles are getting undermined by potentially other factors like money, time, yeah, yeah demands. <clears throat> I think the first thing is you always got to start with from what's the best thing for the game first and then go backwards. So when I mentioned the Elden Ring example, that's a specific example in the sense that like that's somebody's cheese dream and they don't really care if it's going to be popular or not. That's what they're putting out there. It just so happens that 10 million people or whatever, you know, kind of also buy it. But personally, I've also been in meetings before where when an idea comes up, somebody says, that's not going to work because the publishers aren't going to go for it. That's not going to work because this other game did it and they didn't work for them, so it's not going to work for us and stuff. That goes back to the other thing I just mentioned is that's a little bit of a sourpuss that you probably don't want in those kind of meetings. I think you've got to start from a place of this is what we want to do for the game. This is what we think is best for the game. Okay, at some point we might have to curb things a little bit. You know, it's all going to be a compromise. But I, I wouldn't start with a compromise, personally. I would, I would kind of work there in. But also, it comes with experience as well. So, you know, somebody doing a project for the first time wouldn't necessarily see the bumps in the road that you're eventually going to have if you laser in on that one decision. But, uh, but yeah, for sure it's a compromise. Um, in fact, related to that, I'll probably make an amendment to this to say that this is in a perfect world, which, which we don't live in. Yeah, cheers to that. I think there's a couple of hands over here. Yeah, the front. Um, with the plussing, what's one of the, what, do you have any special techniques when it comes to working with diverging opinions in a room during a meeting, but you're still trying to amplify two voices and make sure that you're able to make good compromises and blends? Yeah. So is that if it's too many people in the room are disagreeing with each other or somebody's not getting their voice kind of heard? Is it more about that? When you have just two diverging opinions and two people, you're, you're trying to pl if you're trying to plus, yep. how do you, do you have any like best tips on being able to neg negotiate and deal with those kind of things? I think maybe just start with one of the ideas and just chase that down the rubber hole until people stop and then go, actually, there's that other thing. You know, let's just go back to that. The reason I mention that is, if you're chatting about one thing, you know, say the Call of Duty example, somebody in the room says we want to take all the ammo out of the game, and then somebody says, oh, yes, and we can also remove grenades, and yes, and we can also do this other. Somebody else says, that's a stupid idea. Let's just add, you know, as much grenades and as bombs in the game as possible or something. It really depends on, firstly, what the experience is. of what. You, so if you don't have goals and intent, or you don't have a clear experience, then you're not going to get led closer to one direction or another. If they're clearly two different things that are both valid, then personally, I would just stick with one of the routes until the rabbit hole is kind of, you know, emptied out and then go, oh, OK, let's go back to that other person's kind of idea and go down that route instead. Then at that point, it just becomes a choice, you know, what's kind of interesting. You could say, oh, well, maybe you can try blend them together. But in that Call of Duty example, one person wants to remove ammo, one person wants to add ammo. That's clearly a conflict. But, but personally, I would just stick with go with one route, go down the rabbit hole. When the rabbit hole stops, go down the other rabbit hole. Just go from there, personally. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, one more. Uh, just third from back. Hey. Um, so you spoke earlier about um, the idea of you had the spear on Little John, and then removing that, you got a bunch of feedback, and then that turned into sort of a problem that then eventually got fixed. Um, with development, like a lot of the time, we sort of question a lot about what we want to add or, or remove and run into these problems earlier. Um, and we're like, oh, we don't want to change this because of this problem, or we know that these problems are going um, to sort of rear their head. Um, is there anything you would suggest in terms of like how we solve those or how we at least discuss those prior to then going into, into a change? Because as you said, like you get a bunch of feedback that is, this, this sucks, right? Um, and really, you kind of want to ignore that until you can at least get that solution uh, tested and in, right? Yeah, so is it more about, you have an idea that maybe is unpopular to take something out of the game, or maybe it's got a big impact on the game, and then some people are saying, well, keep that in the game because they want to keep it, but they don't necessarily see maybe the next couple of steps, or they don't see the path. So the way I describe this one is, I think for some great designers, generally speaking, they can like paint the picture on the other side of the river, and they can also lay all the stepping stones to kind of get there. So one of the things that we had in that was we said that we clearly wanted to separate the characters it like into ranged and kind of melee. We knew that's where we were going. Like that's the picture on the other side of the river that we're getting to. The first step is just to do one of the most unpopular things in the game at that time. 
but people on the project couldn't necessarily see the pitch that we were going to paint. You know, maybe it's more about, you know, we didn't present it well enough or wherever it may be. Maybe they didn't have the context, but sometimes you have to do three, four, five steps to get to kind of where you want to be. And the first one, you're going to get resistance against it. That's the other thing. Relate to that, I didn't put this in this talk, but we chat about this in our team is basically like possession is nine tenths of the law. And you've got to be very careful with that in games, which is as soon as something goes in the game, people latch onto it and they get attached to it. And as soon as it comes out, they find it very difficult than if it wasn't there in the first place. So just to keep that in mind. But I think the answer that, to that really is you got to know where you're going. you got to know all the steps to kind of get you there. And also you've got to weather the resistance on the way. Um, if you're confident about kind of where you're going, and that might have a big impact on like the audience or even the other thing mentioned about you know the publishers don't like the idea or you know it's not going to be popular with the fans and so on. But yeah, I'll, I'll probably say it's more of a communication thing ahead of time. All right, I think that is it. Um, have a good night.